Hello, everybody, and welcome to our celebration of World Book Night and the opening event of our Watch Your Story Chorley online events. We're not on the set of Line of Duty, although it might look a little bit like that. We are actually in the offices of South Ribble Council, who have kindly facilitated this meeting tonight. So for those of you that aren't aware, this is the eighth year of Watch Your Story Chorley, which is a community event organised with the support of Chorley Borough Council, Ebb and Flow Bookshop, Chorley Library, Chorley Theatre and a group of volunteers. Uh, my name is Mandy Howarth and I come into the last category in that list. Last year, five days before our event, lockdown was announced and we had to pull everything. We were determined to have an event this year, so we've gone viral, hence us welcoming you to this online event tonight. It's a strange experience for us all. We're hoping it'll work. Um, we have every confidence that it will. So we're really lucky tonight to have Joanne Sefton here. Hello, um, it's really nice to be here. Thank you, Mandy. She's making World Book Night special for us all. As an audience, you'll be able to ask questions. Some of you, I see, have already posted questions. And we'll try and make sure that we put these to Joanne as are our progresses. So, Joanne, welcome. Thanks so much for giving us your time tonight. Joanne was born in Scotland, but her family moved to Chorley in 1989 when she was just nine years old. And they settled in Eccleston, where Joanne went to school as in her primary school, and then in her secondary years went to St Michael's in Chorley. She moved away to university and spent 20 years um, developing her career as a lawyer and living in both London and Bath. Before, and these are her words, she saw the error of her ways and returned to live in Eccleston in 2019. So as well as being a lawyer and a mother of two children, Joanne has managed to find the space in her life to create, to complete a, an MA in creative writing and write two very successful novels. Perhaps we can start, Joanne, with what started you on this road to being an author? These microphones only let one person speak at a time, so I, I couldn't cut into Mandy's introduction and uh, apologise to the people of London and Bath. <laughs> um, but assuming that not too many of them are, are watching, then yes, yeah, saw the error of my ways. <laughs> so uh, started as an author, I don't think that there is a, a start really. Um, I think First of all, I was a reader and I've been a reader for as long as I can remember and loved the different worlds that books opened up uh, and could only imagine how fantastic it would be to be able to create my own worlds and, and put them on the page. And I suppose we mentioned that uh, I qualified as a lawyer and, and getting to that age of starting to think about what I wanted to do with my life. Uh, the road to becoming a lawyer wasn't easy, but it was very marked out. You do your degree, you do your professional training uh, and so on. And I think it was hard for me to see how I could become a writer, how, how writers um, went about that. So I, it never crossed my mind as something serious in terms of a career option. But what did happen was that I was constantly writing in my head. I was still reading books all the time and I was still writing in my head uh, characters, people that I would see, uh, scenes around me, just little turns of phrase because I've always really enjoyed language. Um, and then I started to think more and more about how I could develop that um, started to look at doing courses. Uh, so I did a, a one week residential course with an organisation called Arvin that I know you've been involved with. Um, they offer these fantastic retreats in wonderful countryside locations. 
Um, and then when I was in London, I did an evening course uh, with City University. And again, lots of universities and adult education uh, colleges offer evening courses for interest in different sorts of creative writing. And the more that I did, the more that I wanted to do. And for me, working through a, that sort of structure, it's re really worked. So I, I took a year out of the law in um, 2011, I think, around then, and did an MA in creative writing at Bath Spa. And by the end of that, uh, I pretty much had a novel. And I'd always, I'd started lots of things and I'd written lots of shorter pieces, but for me, it took being able to have that year out uh, in order to, to get to the beginning and the end and have that sense of achievement of feeling, yes, I, I can write something. Um, that novel wasn't published, so that's a, a different story, but it was definitely a very big landmark to be able to, to write something from the beginning to the end. Thinking about the actual writing process and when you sit down to write, I'm wondering about whether you have anything that kind of encourages you, like, for example, some people might listen to music. What about you? I think I find that I have to be quite pragmatic about how I fit writing into my life around work and around family. So quite often it is sitting with the laptop on my knee on the sofa when the rugby's on because other people in my house like watching the rugby. But it's not going to be too much of a distraction uh, for me. Um, I, I think music's a really important part of what I write. I find it's a really good way to get into character. I like to think about what my characters would be listening to and what's influencing them in their life. I do find it um, quite hard to listen to that music while I'm writing because it takes over. You get too hooked into the lyrics. So sometimes I'll have some background music on with the radio on. But if I'm really engrossed in what I'm doing, then you get to the end and find you've not heard any of it anyway. One of the questions that's come in, I know, on, on the Slido is, what advice would you give to someone who wants to start writing? I know you've talked about your process, but, but what would advice would you give? Uh, I think the first thing that I'd say is it's very much what works for you. And lots of people are very keen to give writing advice, uh, but it's different for everybody. Um, if you're looking to start writing, then it really is a case of just do it. Just take a, a tiny amount of time and try and do a tiny amount of, of writing. If ultimately you want to write a novel, um, it's it's such a marathon, or I find it that way anyway, uh, that it's really easy to, to give up b before you get going and just to break it down and say, well, I'm going to take a small writing cue and do a little bit of writing and, and build it up from there. I also think although writing is very solitary, that for me, and I think for a lot of other people, um, it's really important to, to find your tribe a bit and find other people that you can share those experiences with. Um, I'm on Twitter. I've virtually met a lot of other writers through that, and I really enjoy the information that I get from that and the links that I get from that to events like this um, to, to see what other people are doing. Uh, and also one of the really important things for me about having gone on the courses that I mentioned earlier, is the the groups that can form from the back of those courses where you're uh, interacting with people who are at the same kind of stage in the process as you are, and you can share work, you can criticize or, or, or have feedback groups, and you learn from other people's feedback on your own work, but also the process of analyzing and giving feedback on other people's writing I think for me has really strengthened and improved my own writing as well. So at the moment, I'm a member of a, a workshop group and I've been quite lucky because it's my bath workshop group and I was really missing it. And what lockdown has meant, of course, is that that, that group's gone virtual. Um, so I'm able to, to fully participate in it at the moment. And having that coming back into my life uh, once a month uh, has made such a big impact on my motivation to, to write and my confidence about what I'm doing. So definitely find your group and try and share your writing with other people. 
That's, that's some really useful tips there. I mean, I was going to ask you how the pandemic has affected you as a writer, and you've touched upon it there, but maybe you can tell us a bit more. Yeah, I think it's affected um, everything for everybody, hasn't it? Uh, it's, uh, at first, um, I found it very hard, kind of this time last year, to write at all. And I think that that was quite common um, with a, a lot of professional writers, um, again, that I know through Twitter, saying similar things about just how hard it was to do something creative in those first weeks of, of kind of uncertainty. And there's obviously practical issues with a lot of people having children home from school and that uh, affecting time that they had to write. But I think also it's more fundamental than that, that when there was so much uncertainty around about where we, where we were, people concerned for their health and concerned for family members, um, I think that can generate a lot of creativity afterwards, but to actually create in that moment um, is, is probably virtually impossible. Uh, and, and what I found, and I, I don't think it's unrelated, I was working on a project for another novel. Um, I have two novels published, as has been publicised in the run-up to this event, and I know we're going to be talking about them later. But the project that I was working on, I sort of came to an almost conclusion. Uh, I got substantially through a first draft by summer of last year and then just thought, I don't want to do this. This isn't the right thing to be doing. Um, and at the point where I would have been going back and making those significant revisions, I actually decided the whole thing's going in a drawer. And I may well go back to it, but I think that was actually very linked to the pandemic and just uh, feeling that that wasn't the right thing for me at, at that time. So it's had a big impact. It's really interesting, isn't it? Because it will be interesting to see what writing and creativity does come out of the pandemic. If I just come back to that, I, I think it's fascinating um, and there's a lot of debate that I've heard around whether people want pandemic books. <laughs> and I think a, a lot of feeling that at the moment we don't want to read about it. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily see myself ever writing a pandemic book. I think what's interesting from my point of view is that I do like to set my books in real time. Um, and I do like to reference what's going on in the outside world. Uh, so, for example, there's a there's a chapter in If They Knew where um, there's reference made to the Cuban Missile Crisis and that being in the news and the characters are kind of comparing that to her own situation. And I really enjoy writing that, but I also really enjoy kind of going and finding out what would have been going on for characters at that particular time um, and deciding what to incorporate and how to incorporate that. Uh, so I think that it will be interesting to see uh, what use is made of it kind of as a as a setting or um, or in the backgrounds of novels in the future. I think that's what interests me more than the pandemic novel, which I'm sure other people will write. Uh, and the the view that we get of it as a background event um, will be quite different, I think, to how it seems just now. So imagine the situation then, and this is another question that I know has come in from people, um, pandemic or not pandemic book, you've, you've written a novel, you've mentioned that your first novel wasn't published. Advice to somebody who, who wants to publish a novel, how would you advise? Um, there's, there's a lot more decisions to be made now, I think, than there was sort of perhaps uh, 20 years ago, maybe even 10 years ago. Um, Self-publishing has become really respected, really big. I know a lot of people who have gone down that route as a first choice, um, who haven't approached publishers and who are very happy with that. Um, my, I'm not an expert on that. My understanding is that you need to put a lot of work in to things like your formatting, your cover, your marketing. And some people love that and they can really get involved in it and you have much more control than you do through the traditional publishing routes. 
Um, so I can definitely see the appeal. For me, I want to just hand it over um, and I want someone to turn around and show me, here's your story and we've turned it into a lovely book for you. <laughs> uh, so for me, I think the traditional publishing route was always more appealing. Um, and again, I went through the traditional gateway to that of having a literary agent. Um, there's the internet makes everything more accessible. There's lots of agents on Twitter. If you follow them, they will tell you what they're looking for and what they're interested in. And um, also all the agencies have their own websites, a lot of them with really informative blogs about the way that they like to work. So you can get a sense of somebody's personality and um, almost before you decide who you want to approach. Um, and then all the websites will have uh, the information that they want uh, in terms of a submission. But you normally send them a covering letter, a synopsis setting out the plot of the whole book and your first three chapters. But you only send the first three chapters when you have written the whole book, because what you're really hoping is that they love it and you get the email back saying, send me the rest of this straight away. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got to be ready to do that. <laughs> So let's turn to a book that that happened to, <laughs> um, your first novel, If They Knew. You very kindly said that you will read some of it. This was published in 2018. Um, yeah, that's right. So this was um, my first published novel uh, after well, the book that I completed on the MA, I sent to uh, a number of agents and they said that they loved the plot and they loved the writing, but the two didn't go together. <laughs> so um, this was my attempt to take that feedback on board and to write something that hopefully would appeal to the market. And that that's a fine line to tread, because if you write something for today's market, then by the time it's been published in three or four years, that's moved on. Um, but equally, if you do want to be published, and especially if you want to be traditionally published, um, you have a much greater chance of success if you write, if you're aware of what's being published presently, um, what's doing well, what's generating interest. Um, so it was with that kind of broad awareness that I sort of sat down to write this book. Um, and it's a, it, it's a domestic noir, family, suspense, secrets and lies, all those kind of things uh, set across a number of years. So I'm going to read the start of the book and it opens in 1963 with a character called Katie um, and who Katie is and what her role is in the events that then unfolds in the present day uh, is really the mystery at, at the heart of the book. So these Katie's chapters from 1963 are sort of dropped in throughout the first, uh, first half or so of the book. Um, so here we are with Katie in June 1963. She wondered if there would still be honeysuckle. From the car window, she caught sight of it from time to time. Flashes of mottled flowers on the motorway embankment and in the hedgerows. Pink and cream against the bright beech and shadowy hawthorn. There had been honeysuckle in flower a year ago, scrambling around the edges of the building site its tendrils grasping over the broken earth and scattered debris and scenting the afternoon air. It would be all different now, but still, she would like Mary to have honeysuckle. That was why they were coming today, Mr Robertson had said. It might seem more familiar at this time of the year. Katie might be able to remember something new. It was also the last chance before the building was due to open to the public. Katie didn't want to remember at all. Last time they had brought her back, it had been winter. The windows of Mr. Robertson's stately old Austin had frozen up while he waited for her. Katie remembered that, and she remembered Etta, wrapped in a fur coat with a black felt hat and gloves, standing stiff with malice, whilst Katie and the police shivered from the cold. It has all been different to that first June day with Mary. In winter, there had been no broken earth and no wire fences, no ramshackle no man's land where the site met the farms. By January, it was all flat tarmac surfaces, white paint and clean lines. 
Builders' vans were parked neatly by the entrance and a pair of window fitters had stopped work to gop at them until one of the coppers went over to have a word. This is us then, Mr Robertson called from the front seat, bringing Katie back to June, back to Honeysuckle in the present. Miss Silver, sitting next to her, gave her hand a quick squeeze, as if she were embarrassed but felt she had to do it anyway. There was a copper waiting at the bottom of the slip road. Mr Robertson pulled in, past the signs advertising next week's grand opening of the service station. Morton Chase, it was going to be called. Someone had told Katie that last time. The Austin slowed as if to stop, but the young constable waved them on, scurrying to replace the painted wooden traffic cones that were being used to block the slip lane. As the car swung around a wide bend into the car park, Casey felt her heart beat faster. She didn't want to remember what happened a year ago. She didn't want to feel Mary's weight in her arms. She didn't want to see Mary's face. Instead, she forced her mind's eye downwards, remembering only her own feet in their scuffed school shoes, tramping through the grass and clover on a sunny June morning. Fabulous, thank you. There's so many what ifs and whys there. <laughs> um, I don't want to give any spoilers away because I'm very aware that there are people who won't have read the book and people who have read the book. But um, I hope it's not too much of a spoiler to say that Katie was involved in a criminal act. Um, just wondering whether you've ever used your experience as a lawyer to either um, base that, experience, that, that, that knowledge of, of, of a character or a situation I'm not necessarily suggesting in this one, but uh, have you used that experience? Um, that's quite an interesting question because I would always have said no, I've not. Um, I, I don't practice in crime and um, everybody thinks, oh, you're a lawyer, you must have all these great stories and that, that's not really my area at all. Um, but lots of people that have read the books and um, particularly uh, if they knew, but also the guilty friend, seem to see that sense of legal kind of background in there somewhere. So I, I don't know if subconsciously <laughs> I've just um, absorbed and, and put some of it in. Um, I think it does also help with, uh, with writing the books that as a lawyer, I'm very organised. And I'm very keen on a chronology. <laughs> and if you're going to write a book that uh, deals with different um, time frames uh, and deals rights from the perspective of different characters and shifts around between those, which is something that I find really interesting and something that I think possibly will always be uh, in my books because I really enjoy doing it, having that kind of forensic sense of organisation and what's going on where um, certainly really helps. Uh, I. I did uh, know a writer who got their copy edits back and got told that uh, they had a character who was pregnant for about 23 months. So <laughs> trying to avoid that kind of uh, uh, that kind of problem, um, I think some of the lawyer skills come in useful. I was actually going to ask you that, Joanne. What both of your books actually um, alternate between different time frames and different characters, and and what are the challenges of that apart from having somebody pregnant for twenty three months? <laughs> Anessa and elephant. Um, I think there there is a complexity to it. For me, that's something that I find really enjoyable as a reader, and um, I quite like reading books where you don't know how this bit fits in with this bit over here and that's something that's slowly unraveled through the course of uh, of the novel um, and that's something that I also enjoy playing with in, in my writing. Um, I suppose it, it can put some people off, it's, it's not everybody's cup of tea, um, but I for me personally, I struggle to see any downside in it. You know, I don't see it as a problem for me as a writer. I see it very much as an opportunity and something that I, I enjoy doing. Mm. I'll just go to a question that's come through on the Slido, which is an interesting one, and it's kind of similar-ish, but how difficult, uh, this is from, from Susan, how difficult is it for you to choose the names for the characters in your books? And do you ever choose the names of people you know? Um, hello, Susan. Thank you for your question. Um, it's, 
I think it's something that's really important. I do put quite a lot of time into it, not not necessarily initially, because sometimes I just need to write the character. Um, but afterwards, before I'm finalising uh, the book, it's really important to me to get the right name. And sometimes I'll go through a few iterations of names. I try and avoid um, choosing names of people that I know um, deliberately. I overlooked that we do have a very good uh, friend called Darren and Darren is the um, slightly not up to scratch um, husband in If They Knew uh, and it was only after the book had been published and I was talking about it with them um, with the couple that we we're friends with and I suddenly found myself making a very stumbling that it wasn't really meant to be about him at all and it was a complete accident. Um, the other thing that's uh, lovely on names, I was asked when I was writing The Guilty Friend um, if I would participate in a charity auction for Great Ormond Street um, and if I would offer the opportunity to name a character mm. in the book. So one of the characters in The Guilty Friend, um, who's fantastically called Philomena, which is a brilliant name, um, was picked uh, by the winner of the the auction but I just had the name then so I was able to fit it into the book in the place that I thought was most appropriate but I think it's I was really pleased that it happened because I think it's a fantastic name for that character um, and not necessarily one that I would have come up with by myself. Can we move on to the guilty friend that would be lovely to do that if you could um, that was published the next year I think 2019 um, and you've again kindly offered to read us a bit from The Guilty Friend. So this isn't from the, the start of The Guilty Friend. This is from partway through. Uh, and The Guilty Friend follows a group of university friends uh, who are now later on in their life. Um, and one of them has teenage daughters. Uh, and one of the point of view characters in the book is Tasha, who is one of the teenage daughters. And through the book, um, she develops uh, an eating disorder and she develops anorexia. Uh, and that plays a, a role uh, within the wider plot. But we do also have some parts that focus on, on Tasha and her own experience. Um, so this is a, a little couple of pages from Tasha's point of view. Um, and the reason that I picked this, to be honest, is because it's at a party. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't know about anyone else, but I'm just missing being around people. And it, it was nice to go back and reread um, something set in that setting, uh, even though Tasha's not particularly impressed with the party herself. Uh, so this is from Tasha. It had gone one o'clock in the morning and her mum's friends were still infesting the back garden, drinking gin like there was going to be a shortage, ranting loudly about Brexit and generally embarrassing themselves. Joy. Why would anyone even want to celebrate turning 50? She wondered. You may as well celebrate being dead. Evie, who's the older sister, perhaps I should have said. Evie typically was all over it, handing round trays of party food and remembering people's names and stuff like it might help her get an internship or something. Or maybe she was looking for a rich banker wanting a second wife. Even Uncle Shu had noticed she was overdoing it earlier on and had had, had to take her aside for a word, much to Tasha's amusement. Still, it made a change for them to notice something. She might have guessed it would be Evie. Never mind the fact that she'd lost nine pounds in the last six weeks and nobody had bothered to say a single word of congratulations. The losing weight bit was turning out to be easier than she'd imagined it would be, although there had been times when the hanger had got pretty extreme. Tasha certainly hadn't appreciated having to hand out those stupid canapes all afternoon. If people ever stopped to think about how many calories you get in a tempura prawn, then the Thai oceans would be safer places by far. She reckoned it was because she had GCSEs coming up. Everyone was just expecting her to be grumpsville anyway. In this world, you had to be mad if you thought there was anything to be cheerful about. Between Trump and global warming, Tash knew that it would be a miracle if the human race was still running by the time she was old enough to be having a 50th birthday party. The trick to dieting, she'd found, was willpower, and that was something Tash had always been good at. 
the first few pounds came off really easily, but then it started to slow up. Apparently that's what happens. Your body adjusted to taking in fewer calories. She'd been reading some stuff on the internet to explain it, and she found some sites with really good tips on how to feel full and take your mind off eating and stuff. Some of the girls posting on there had gone way too far though. They posted these pictures of themselves where they looked like freaky marble heads on sticks. And all the regular posters were like, babe, you look amazing. And Tash really felt like typing, whoa, girl, eat some chips. But still, the tips were good. She'd been all set to enjoy the party. She planned to have such a good time with Stano that she wouldn't even be thinking about stuffing her face with the mini cheesecakes. But Lola and a couple of the others let her down at the last minute, so there was no one really to show him off to. Stano seemed surprised she'd not ask Claire and Sonal, but it'd be pointless to try to explain to him. Boys never really got school friendship politics stuff. It was all too complicated for their little brains. I have to say it's rather tantalising of you to put that <laughs> set, in a, set in a, at a party when we, we are definitely all missing that, aren't we? <laughs> it's not the most festive party scene, but, <laughs> but there we go. It's not the most festive book. <laughs> No, and, and it's like um, if they knew it's a book that deals with an important issue um, that I guess like child grooming in, in if they knew that might be something that you would have to research and I'm sure that's something that you have to do for your books. How do you go about that? And um, I, I think I was quite hesitant about approaching the subject of anorexia in particular um, because it is something that affects a lot of people um, and in a way you know the the serious crimes uh, the sort of murder and sexual crimes that form so much of the, um, the suspense books that people like to read uh, there's not necessarily an expectation that an author has got any direct experience of, of that uh, whereas something like eating disorders that do affect a much wider group of people and are um, perhaps less common as subject matter for a suspense book, that it gives rise to an expectation, well, is that something that you've been through? Did you know someone that's been through it? How have you, you researched it? In a way that no one questions if you want to write about a murder. <laughs> um, but it was, it was important to me um, before I set out on it to make sure that I had an understanding of the subject and to confirm that it was something that I felt that I that I could write about and that I wanted to explore and one of the reasons that I did want to explore it is because I felt that it was quite under explored in in fiction um, so I did do quite a lot of research by reading um, non-fiction books and memoirs and um, looking at blogs looking at, at what's online um, I was never totally sure that I'd done a good job um, and I I met up or we met up with some family friends uh, a few weeks ago um, and the woman that I was meeting told me that well asked if I had had personal experience and said that she had which isn't something that I'd ever known um, and that it really rang true uh, and that she thought either that I must have done or that it had been very well researched. So it was a, it meant a lot to me to hear that from somebody um, that, I, that I did know personally um, who could have just not mentioned it at all if she'd felt in any way uncomfortable with the portrayal. And, and obviously it would be different for everybody, uh, but to know that the book had worked for her and had seemed realistic um, was one of the most positive pieces of feedback I've had about this book. It was really, really good. On the back of that answer, do, do you feel then as a writer you have a responsibility to convey certain messages about issues? Um, I think that's another really good question. <laughs> um, and it, it ties into a lot of other discussions that are um, obviously alive at the moment about appropriation and who has the right to write what. Um, and there's there's a lot of complicated arguments going going in both directions. I think if you're writing with the purpose of sending a message, then you need to think very hard about whether you should be writing a novel 
Um, for me, the purpose of novels is to entertain uh, rather than to send a message. Um, so I wouldn't seek to do that. But I think in setting out to entertain, um, an author has a responsibility. And what that responsibility is kind of varies with each book. Uh, but for example, as part of my research for The Guilty Friends, um, I came across, without too much difficulty, some fairly sort of obvious pointers and do's and don'ts uh, for articles and books that are discussing eating disorder issues. So for example, um, not to mention a specific weight because that can then be used by people to compare themselves to her as a target and so on. So even before I'd set out to write the book, that was very clear in my head that I had to write it in such a way that, um, that Tasha's actual weight or BMI or any kind of figures like that aren't mentioned. And I guess if I just kind of blundered into it, then I might have put that kind of information in uh, just without really thinking about it. So I think if you if you choose to take on a topic like this, then you do have a responsibility to make sure that you're informed and, and to do your best by that by that topic. Thank you. That's that's really interesting. Um, both The Guilty Friend and, and If They Know have twists and turns and mysteries in their stories. And the word thriller comes to mind, certainly with um, If They Knew. Do you see yourself as a writer of a particular genre? I, I think it really helps for uh, for publishers and book sh bookshops <laughs> if they're able to uh, to put it on the shelf uh, next to other books and say if you like this one you'll like this one or they're all crime thrillers and um, even although as I said I wrote if they knew with a view to writing something um, that was more marketable and aligns more with what was out there than the work that I that I'd done previously. I still didn't see it when I was writing it as a thriller. Um, I saw it as a, a, a family mystery, family secrets mystery type book. Um, and it was it's the publisher's choice as to how it's marketed. Uh, and we were talking earlier a bit about self-publishing and the control that you have with that. And it is something to have your eyes open to that if you do go down the traditional publishing route, um, then the publisher, who is the professional and who has experience in all these things, um, will decide what the book's going to be called, what the house is going to look like, how it's going to be marketed. And of course, you have input in all of those things. It's a collaboration. Um, but ultimately, those decisions will, will rest with them. So uh, it, here we have it as a psychological thriller. That's where it ended up. I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with that. I read psychological thrillers. Um, I, there's fantastic books out there sitting in that category. Um, and then The Guilty Friend was a follow up. And I, I think with that, I set myself a bit of a challenge of writing something that con conforms to the genre expectations of a psychological thriller um, without having um, some of the classic crime elements that, that go along with that. Um, so it's, it's obviously it's up to the readers uh, to decide whether or not that succeeded. So going outside that genre completely, have you thought about maybe writing a book for children or historical fiction or any other? Writing for children be very much outside that genre. <laughs> um, I, I think I'm definitely interested in uh, exploring different genres within adult fiction. Um, the project that I'm working on at the moment, uh, I'd say probably broadly is historical fiction. And it's um, it doesn't have the contemporary strands uh, that these two books both have exactly where it ends up um, in terms of genre is yet to be determined uh, both because of what I said about the publishers uh, but also because it's far from finished yet and uh, I'm not quite sure uh, where where it's going to be. In terms of writing children's books um, I always loved the idea of being a children's author 
And I think that comes right back to what I said at the start about being a reader before being an author. And the books that possibly meant the most to me and were most influential were the books that I read as a child and in my early teens, I think, because that's the age at which you're most impressionable. And some of those books that I reread and reread and have such um, strong memories of, the reason that I decided not to go down that route, and I had, um, before I did the MA, I had had a go at, at doing some children's writing. Um, and I had to make the choice when I got on the course. There was a, a children's writing section of it and an um, adult fiction section of it. And at that time, um, I didn't have children. And I thought it was so important to be reading what you're writing. And plenty of children's authors don't have children, obviously read those books for themselves. Um, but at that time, I wasn't doing that. And I wanted to write the sort of book that I might read. And um, since then, I've happily become a lot more acquainted with the uh, with the children's book world. And there is just such startling talent out there. And the books that I read um with uh, particularly my son because he's younger and he still likes likes to be read to um there's uh strewn murray is a favorite of his uh shipwreck island um has just come out and that book gets um waved around our house <laughs> um and uh hannah gold the last bear which is about saving polar bears and it's a it's an eco book and that's another favorite and and that was presented to me a few months ago with um if you want to be a better writer mummy <laughs> you should read this one <laughs> um so now that i really do feel much more up to speed with all the amazing stuff in contemporary children's literature um, maybe that makes me more equipped to have a go. Um, maybe it just means the competition's so fantastic that I should I should step aside. I don't know. Remains to be seen. I think have a go. <laughs> We're getting some fabulous questions through on the Slido, and we still have got time. If you want to submit a question, please do. Um, there's um, one from Susan here. When you put a story together. Do you have the whole plot worked out in your head before you start writing? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very short answer. I have absolutely no idea. Um, and I would love to be able to plot everything out. Um, but for me, it's it comes to me as characters. It comes to me as settings, even sort of an, an atmosphere that I want to create. And I have to write my way into it. And that can mean that quite a lot of what I write um, ends up metaphorically on the cutting room floor, that it, when I do have a plot, it doesn't fit in, but it's all helped me to, to get there. Fabulous. Um, this is someone who's obviously done their research, Joanne. This is from Jackie. What did you get your Blue Peter badge for? I, th I think that is there and um, possibly in, on the HarperCollins website or something like that. I got my Blue Peter badge for drawing a picture um, of the famine in Ethiopia, which uh, well, I think you've already said that I was nine when I moved here in 1989, so we're not keeping any secrets about age. <laughs> but I, I must have been seven or eight and Blue Peter were fundraising for it. Um, and I'm sure, like so many kids of that generation, it, it was the first kind of um, big news thing that really captured me. And I was desperate to help out, as we all were. And so that's what I got my Blue Peter badge for. Thank you so much for telling us that. Um, Chorley Libraries um, played a big part in Watch a Story, Chorley. Um, are libraries important to you as a writer? Um, I'm really, really pleased to be here and support the library because I just think that they're so fantastically important. Um, I was a probably a twice weekly regular in Eccleston Library uh, growing up. Um, that was where I got most of my reading from and there were so many books in there that I read over and over again. Um, coming back, I'm so 
amazed at how things have moved on and impressed um, the, the selection in Chorley Library and the selection of books that goes out to the local libraries like Eccleston. And Eccleston Library is, is pretty tiny. It's smaller than it was uh, since it's moved uh, when, when I was using it as a teenager. Um, but the, the selection of books that they have and the way that they keep them up to date um, is amazing. Um, the service that they provided over lockdown with the six of the best, um, everyone in our families got really great selections from that. Um, but also wider than the library as well. I think what's um, great about Chorley Library is that the way that they're helping to build this literary community within Chorley. And we didn't have Ebb and Flow books when I was here before. They're fantastic in the way that they don't, they're in no way in competition with the library. They're working together to promote events like this. Um, and that helps more people find out about myself and other writers. Uh, I just think it's really positive everything that the library is doing just now. Thank you. And um, um, we couldn't have done much of what we've done without the support of the library service. So it's, it's great. Um, Polly's asked a question. Uh, some of the things you kind of touched on, but I, I don't want to not ask her question. Um, do you think it's important to do a writing course before you before trying to write seriously? And, and on the back of it as well, do you have any tips for finding a community of writers? Um, that's two really good questions. And absolutely don't be put off writing seriously because you've not done a course or it doesn't work for you to do a course um it, it's not the right thing for everybody i found it really really helpful and i think it's also helpful that there are kind of courses for every level there's the dip your toe in courses and then you can commit a year of your life and and go off and do an ma i probably wouldn't suggest going off to do an ma um, unless you have either done quite a lot of writing on your own or have done some shorter courses so that, that you've got a sense that it's definitely something that you want to do. Um, I really don't think that you can teach writing. I think that you learn writing by reading, by reading in an analytical way, by scrutinising and improving your own work and by scrutinising and improving other people's work. And for me, the courses gave me the opportunity to do that. But it's absolutely not that there is a magic formula in how to write that somebody is going to stand up at, at the front of a classroom and, and tell you. So if I had to choose between is the course more important or is the community more important, definitely the community. But the course sometimes gives you the opportunity to meet those people um, and, and to do that. Um, if Aside from that, because Polly's second question was, how do you find that community if you're not going to find it through a course? Um, how, how do we do everything these days? It's got to be the internet, hasn't it? Um, I don't know. I, I think it's not the easiest thing to find people that you're necessarily going to gel with. And that is one of the advantages of meeting through a course, because you kind of get the, the chance to um, to try, try it out. And all the groups that I have been part of that's how we've started um, so I'm, I'm not sure that I'm very well equipped to give tips but I, I guess just sit your hand up and see if anyone's interested in joining you thank you um, this is another question that's come through which is from uh, Janet and it says my favorite barrister apart from you <laughs> is Rumpel have you thought of some good stories to tell of your experiences um, it's great that we're getting so many questions through. Uh, thank you for that. Um, yeah, it, as I said before, the, the first thing um, when I first time with an agent and met up with him, he said, you'll have some great courtroom stories. And, uh, and I said, no, re really not. <laughs> it's just just not my area of law. So, um, no, I, I really enjoy the legal work that I do, but it, it's quite different. And I think it's, it's probably going to stay quite different. <laughs> and if you want good stories, go into criminal law. <laughs> and you end up writing line, line of duty, of course. And oh my goodness, doing everybody's head in. Um, there's a question from Amy. 
Um, she says she really loves reading books too for comfort. Are there any books, favourite books, that you've reread in lockdown to make you feel better? And the other that perhaps I'll, I'll, put, I'll add on, she said, has your read, ha, did your reading habits change during lockdown? I'm now desperately trying to remember back to a year ago. <laughs> um, I think I did read more during lockdown. Um, and I think that was a great way of getting away from the worry about everything that, that was going on. And I, I remember really getting into and reading some books quite quickly. Uh, you know, as a teenager, I used to read sort of six books a week and it really goes down. It can take me a while to get through things now. And I've always got a, a big to be read list. I can't on the spot remember what any of them were. And I don't think that I went back to things. I don't tend to go back to things these days. Um, and I think that I had enough things in the to be read pile um, that I went to. Another question that's come through, which might be slightly easier to answer. Are there any authors or titles that really inspired you? Um, lots. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love Kate Atkinson. Um, I think she's a fabulous writer, but she is a fabulous writer in different genres. Um, and I think that that's uh, inspiring. Um, I really like people who write something that, that only they could write or that's quite kind of quite different or quite mold breaking. Um, so I know you and I, Mandy, have talked about Stella Gibbons and, and Cold Comfort Farm, which is a classic that probably quite a lot of people watching will have read. Um, but I, I think that that's uh, it, it, just a, a great book uh, and the language in it um, is fantastic. I've also read that she um, that she killed a genre, that it was very fashionable to write sort of sentimental, sophisticated girl about town goes into the countryside books. Um, and she turned that on its head by uh, turning it into a comedy. And immediately all these sentimental books no longer had a, had a market. Um, so I love what the impact that a book like that can have. Uh, and actually that if I was going to reread something as a comfort read in lockdown, then then that might have been it because it's one of the few that I that I have reread. Um, not can't even remember where that question started, but it, if it turns into an opportunity to enthuse about Cold Comfort Farm, then, uh, <laughs> then I'm happy. Crack on with that one. <laughs> Is there a book that you wish you had written? I suppose the short answer to that is Harry Potter, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> um, again, I, I think what I would love to write is the book that only I could write. Um, I remember reading a book that took my breath away uh, when I was probably in my early 20s. Um, and it was a very early book by Christopher Brittmeyer who's a Scottish writer, he writes some fantasy stuff, but he also wrote this, it was a crime thriller, but it was a comedy crime thriller. Um, and it was just like nothing else I'd ever read. Laugh out loud, funny, um, really grotesque and disgusting in places. Um, I could never write it. If I could, I'd have loved to have written that book. But what maybe I'd like to do one day is write something that's similarly unique um, to something like that. Thank you. Um, this is anonymous, actually, and it's somebody who loved The Guilty Friends, so I don't know why they don't want to put their name, but um, it's a good point to, to, to sort of draw our discussions to a close, really, um, almost. But have, it's, it's, have you started work on your next book yet? I know you've hinted at that, but... Um, Perhaps you can give us a bit more. Yeah, I have. Um, I have started work on the next book. I'm really glad that you liked The Guilty Friends. Um, I had a two book publishing deal for If They Knew. So The Guilty Friends was written under contract in a year. Um, and I'm really 
pleased with how it turns out, but I'm not keen to go back to the pressure of having to deliver a book, particularly having to deliver it within a year. It's nice to have the luxury to experiment. And as I said about last summer, to get to the point and think this isn't working, I'm doing something else. Um, so I'm, I'm fairly far advanced with the project that I started last summer. Um, it, it kind of came to me quite um, suddenly it was something that I'd wanted to write about for a long time but had never really seen the way to be able to write about it and then um, the way to be able to write about it kind of dawned on me in one of those very rare moments of inspiration um, and so far it, it does seem to be going very well but I don't want to say too much about it for fear of uh, for fear of jinxing it. <laughs> I'm sure it'll be fabulous. <laughs> um, just a last little question. The theme for this year's World Book Night, to go back to what we're, we, we, why we're here tonight, really, is books that make you smile. Um, both your books reach some kind of resolution at the end, don't they? Do you feel that a writer should leave a reader smiling? Good question. Um, I think a writer should leave a reader feeling something. I don't think it needs to be a smile. I think it can be sadness or anger or some sense of satisfaction. But maybe the exception to that is with children's books. And maybe that's why I'm loving re-experiencing children's literature so much, because the books in the last few years that have left me with the biggest smile have been the ones that I've read with my children. Um, that come to some fantastic endings. It's lovely to finish on a smile. It's been fabulous speaking to you tonight. I'm not sure how many people we've been speaking to, but whoever it is out there, thank you so much for joining us. Um, thank you, an enormous thank you to Joanne. So a, a virtual clap from everybody, I hope, um, for giving up your time tonight. I don't know whether you just want to yeah, just to say um, thank you very much to everyone who watched. Um, thank you to you, Mandy. It's been a, a slightly surreal experience, um, but uh, a pleasure to uh, answer your questions and to be here um, and to, to be part of the event, which is um, uh, continues tomorrow uh, and uh, is, is really, really good. I'm looking forward to seeing the other videos that are going to go online tomorrow as well. So you've done a spoiler for me now, <laughs> but that's absolutely fine. Yes. Um, thank you so much again. And yes, this is the first online event tomorrow at around about 11. The rest of the What's Your Story Chorley events go live. Very easy to find them on Checkout Chorley. All the links are really, really easy now. Loads of contributions from internationally named name, names, like, international names like Sir Lindsay Hoyle and Frank Cottrell Boyce, local writers, poets, authors, storytellers, all sorts of different things for all different ages. And the other thing that we're doing tomorrow is we're continuing as we were in Chorley Town Centre this morning and this afternoon, and that's giving out books um, again to all ages. So do come down into Chorley Town Centre tomorrow, get yourself a book to read. We even have some copies of Joanne's books. Joanne is going to be there, I think, at some point. I'm not sure. Um, well, I have my first post-lockdown hair appointment tomorrow. It's badly timed after the live YouTube appearance. Um, so it, it depends on how long that takes, but sometime kind of late, late morning lunchtime, I will be there. Um, to say hello to people and to, to hand out books. That's fabulous. So if you'd like to meet Joanne and if you'd just like to come along and meet some of us who've been involved in the organisation of What's Your Story, Chorley, do come down into the back of the market, really, the, the closed mar closed in market, and we'd love to see you. Thank you ever so much for joining us tonight. Thank you.